for many of you, this is the time of year where you are either getting ready to go on spring break or you just came back from spring break. And for the rest of you, look, even if it's not spring break time, this might be a time in the school year where you're really feeling like you need a hard reset or at least like a soft reset, some kind of reset so that you can survive the rest of the school year. So today I wanna to talk about five or six things that are gonna help you, as we often say, not just survive the rest of the school year, but thrive. But before we jump into it, I wanna thank OrCam Learn for sponsoring today's video. first thing is is a real easy one and it might seem a little bit too easy but I'm going to explain why I think that this is a game changer potentially for your class. I think remembering why we are in school is kind of the first like call to action for you and your students in this time of the school year because sometimes we forget as educators why we even started teaching because you get so caught up in the lesson planning and the implementation of those lessons and all the things that the school is asking you to do. It's important to remember to sit with this for a moment of why you do what you do. I often do this with students as well. So we will create some kind of a uh, small piece of wall art that students will write what is their why for being in school. Now, I, I often ask my students to go a bit deeper than just saying, you know, because I have to be or because I want to be, you know, whatever their, their kind of job is. It's what's the what's behind the job? Why do you want that job? So more often than not, my students will say that they want to be rich or they want money and that job pays a lot of money. So it's not that they're particularly passionate about whatever it is that they're about to do or, or want to do. but having the why behind that. So why do you want to make a lot of money? And so getting them to dig deep, because what you want to do is hit that spot in their heart where this actually means something. So I've told this story before, but I had a student in my first year teaching this the first time this kind of idea hit me and I found this student Alton who had kind of been screwing around all year, had particularly poor grades, had very little motivation, at least from what I could see. And when I asked him at the end of the year, uh, what his what his why was he told me that it was his little sister that dad's in and out of the house not around most of the time mom's working a lot has boyfriends that he doesn't really like and so his sister was really his why and my question my students is always this students constantly say things like I would die for my family members for my friends whoever it is the question that you ask students though is would you live for them? And so where I kind of like was talking, when I was talking to Alton about this, the conversation went to this space of like, are you gonna let ninth grade, are you gonna let algebra get in the way of you like living out your dream, having enough money for your own place. Maybe you get a two bedroom because you want your little sister to have a spot to stay because if mom's dating someone new or if dad's acting up or they just need a break from the world, they have their own room, they have their own stuff, they have their, you have their favorite snacks and you can take them to get their hair done whenever you want. You can go to the movies if you want on a Friday night. It was building in this narrative of why this actually matters and putting that smack up on the wall so that kids can look at it every single day and remember, this is why I'm here. This is why I gotta focus. And it's a good reminder for you to kind of steer students to as well. How many of you have students that are reading far below grade level? How many of you have kids that despite their best efforts have a really difficult time staying on task while reading in class? How many of those students are reluctant to ask for help or to receive help when it's given because they don't want the rest of the class to know that they learn differently or that they're on a different level than everyone else. The question then becomes, how do we help those students to improve their learning abilities? The answer is to meet them right where they are with the tools that they need to succeed and the help that they deserve. OrCam Learn is a two-part learning solution. It's both a device for students and a particularly good fit for emerging readers and neurodivergent students with reading differences like dyslexia or ADHD. And it's a web app for teachers with data from each student, which provides teachers with the help that they need so they can find the most efficient way to help their students. So how does this work? OrCam Learn is a handheld device that allows students to access printed or digital text from any surface using a simple point and click operation. OrCam Learn will measure your students' text difficulty, their fluency, the reading rate, 
accuracy, and reading duration. It then instantly delivers a comprehensive report of your student's progress to the student, the parent, and the teacher so that all parties know exactly where that student needs a little extra help. And one of my favorite features is that students can connect Bluetooth or wired headphones directly to the device so they can stay focused and feel safe. OrCam Learn is literally the best device of its kind that I've seen to help students become more confident and excited members of class. Help your students by giving them the right tools that they need to grow and succeed. For more information, you can click the link in the description below to help your students find success in your classroom and beyond. The second thing is, I think for teachers, this is a straight for the teachers, what has worked this year and what hasn't? Like what's been a pain point this year? So several years ago, I realized that in the beginning of the year, everybody has a pen or pencil, right? Everyone has one. However, those things quickly dwindle. All the pens and pencils that their parent or guardian bought for them at the beginning of the year somehow mystically disappear and they forget all of them. Maybe students are losing papers all the time. Maybe there, there's a lot of stuff kids lose. But what I found was that the argument for a kid to say, can I have a pen or pencil? That argument with me takes up a lot of time. It takes up a lot of mind share. It makes me get all in my feelings and, and worked up and, and, and I get like aggravated that some kid can't remember to bring a pen or pencil. But if I just gave them a pen or pencil and said, hey, give this back to me. And even if they didn't, it doesn't matter. I found that it was done. It was finished. And when I started to think like, you know, one of my thoughts was, what if I have to give a pen or pencil to everyone? Well, the obvious answer is you don't. It's not every kid in class, right? Even if it's four or five kids that you gave a pencil to or a pen, it is something that you can easily replace. And it is something that I don't think is worth arguing about. I couldn't tell you how many meetings I have been to with other teachers. We're in a PD and everyone has to sign their their uh, their PD credits at the end. No one has a pen. Yo, y'all have a pen or pencil. I didn't bring one with me. Kind of like when I go to the bank here in America, they just put a pen in the little drive through thing. I don't have to ask about it. And it cuts down on frustration of having to ask for one later. I think the same thing can be said with students that have lost a paper. If we do journal entries, we have a journal entry paper the students have to hand in every week. It is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They hand it in on Friday after the journal entry is completed. When we do an assignment like that, if a kid loses it, it is a whole lot more difficult for me to have the argument, to have them waste time looking through their bag. I'd rather give them a new one. Now look, you still got, now you got to do all the work, right? I'm not going to take you on your word that you had it done this week. So it is literally getting in front of some of those friction points to see what isn't working this year, what's taking my mind share, what's taking my peace, and then just squashing it by just making this little shift where I'm gonna give a student something, and I don't think that student is going to grow up to be an irresponsible human being because they got a pen or an extra worksheet in class. Now, a real quick note on this, I think it is a really good idea. At the end of class, hold one student back, or you could do it yourself if you want to, but especially in the beginning of the year, I find that there are pens all over the floor. You'll still find this at this time of the year. There are pens and pencils everywhere. Pick those things up, put them in a cup, and then those become the pens and pencils that you're giving back to students. Same thing can be done with worksheets. Kids will write their name on it, or they answer the first couple questions, or there's no name on it. But at least I have a worksheet. Sometimes there's a blank worksheet, because I don't know, someone didn't even start it, or they had an extra. Picking those up, it makes it so you don't have to make more copies and you don't have to go out and buy pens and pencils yourself. Within this, the realm of this number two tip, it's also important to notice the things that did work this year. So things that worked last year for us were starting to use things like a timer in class when kids were doing activities, chunking assignments into five and 10 minute chunks, no longer than 10 minute chunks, kept class moving really quickly. And then creating opportunities for students to have more choice in what they were doing. Found that this worked really well too, because kids were able to pick and choose what they wanted to do. They felt like they had a say, they felt like they had more of a voice in class. And so if you see that something's working, don't just let it be a one-off thing. Do that multiple times if it's something that you can replicate because kids will love it every single time. Number three, I like to ask students what they want to do. And I talk about this in my book, a really good question, especially when you're feeling that kind of frustration of this last quarter of the year, is to just ask students, well, let me ask you all a question, right? And I want you to write it down before you tell me what it is. 
what would school look like if it were awesome? Then once students write that down, let them think about it, because I'm, I'm guaranteeing that they've never been asked this question before. You're gonna get a lot of answers that are kind of absurd, right? We watch movies all day, we're allowed on our phones, we should have candy for lunch. It's basically what they give them anyway. I mean, my daughter comes home when they have like extra free breakfast and it's a Pop-Tart and juice, but that's a whole nother story. The idea here is giving kids an opportunity to share what they think. Then have one or two students come up to your board and write down the ideas as students are calling them out. And then you have a list and that list, even if it bears one to two things that you can actually implement into your into your classroom day or maybe into your school day and talking to some of your administrators and such, it's going to help students to feel like they've been heard and they've been asked what their opinion was. Just because we ask kids what they think doesn't mean we have to implement it, but it is nice to be asked. It is nice to be thought of. and. You know, like I said, looking for some of those things that you can possibly implement into your lessons and into your school is a really great way to, to uh, improve student voice and buy-in at the same time. Number four comes from my own personal experience. I grew up uh, in a house where there was a lot of lecturing. Got a lot of lectures about why, uh, you know, my behavior led to this. Now I'm getting this thing taken away or this is why we're not able to do this sort of thing. And look, even if those, even if my folks were right on the money, and I deserved that sort of punishment or that penalty in school. I don't feel like, not that I just don't feel like, I, in my experience, having conversations with students where we lecture them about, this is why we can't do anything fun in here. This is why we're not allowed to go outside. Oh, you know what? If we're gonna act like this, then we're not gonna do anything fun anymore. That right there is creating a power struggle and it's creating a friction point that I think you can do better then, honestly. Sometimes when students aren't acting appropriately. So last year, you know, you know, you know this age old story, you're outside with a magnifying glass starting fire on the side of the school, right? I'm sure every one of you can identify with that. Now, my students didn't believe me when we were reading Lord of the Flies that you could start a fire with glasses. So we took a magnifying glass outside and I showed them uh, in a safe way how you could start a fire with a magnifying glass and that this was indeed true in the book. As we were doing this, I had one class, right? Well, everybody else was mind blown, sucked into the activity, didn't want to go back inside. It's a beautiful day out. I had one class where kids start like pushing each other. Then it like got out of hand. Then it was like, listen, this is ridiculous. Instead of going, you know what? You know what? If you guys can't handle this, we're not going to do this. Thing. We're going to go inside. We're going to sit there. We're going to work silently now. Instead of that, I do shift. I, we did have to go inside, but I said, listen, what I'm noticing is that this isn't the way for y'all to learn, right? Like what I want is for you to be successful. The only reason we do anything the way that we do it in class is because I want you to have an unbelievable amount of success in school. If we're trying to learn like this, like tactile hands-on, if this isn't helping you to find success, then we're gonna go in and we're gonna try something else because I wanna help you be successful. Now right there, kids will oftentimes like tell you that they're not gonna do it anymore, that it's cool, that they want to do this, and you could give it another shot, but if it happens again, it's like, listen, this isn't helping you, right? And my job is to help you. My job is to teach you. Having that conversation with students, it is out of love and it's not out of blame. And so you can have the conversation also, if you do this, I would also suggest holding some of the students back that were doing a particularly good job. So oftentimes you hold like kids back that were not like doing what we were doing or were acting up or whatever. Holding students back at the end of class and saying, hey, listen, I just want y'all to know, I think you were doing a really great job today. You were really engaged and I want you to know that I'm gonna keep working on this. I want to do more stuff like that if that's what you think is fun, engaging or interesting and that's the best way for you to learn. So know that I'm gonna work on some of those kids that were not kind of getting down with what we were doing to see what we can best do for them because I don't ever want to punish a whole class for what a few students have done. And that conversation just lets them know that. You're not sending them home thinking like, oh man, like we don't ever get to do anything cool because Tim and Aaron are always screwing around all the time. Instead, we are creating a space where they know that you know what's going on and that they also know that you're working on it and that you're gonna try to get back to that place. All right, number five, be about it. 
If you say you're going to do something, do it. No excuses. If you say there's no late work, if you say that there is homework, you're not going to do homework anymore. If you say that I'm not going to talk until everyone's quiet. If you say that we need to line up in a straight line so we can go outside and do something fun and everyone is kind of like all over the place. If you said you're going to do it and you don't do it, everyone just knows now that you don't really hold up to what you're saying you're going to do. Sometimes that hurts. Sometimes it's painful to try to get kids to act accordingly so that we can go and do something that is fun, that is cool, that is exciting, that is interesting. But we have to remember this. I think that one, kids are kids, right? That's not an excuse, it's a reason. And I know that that pushes people's buttons sometimes, but I'm saying it anyway. The other thing is, that I really think that kids aren't used to doing cool stuff. I think that kids are used to like school being like a drill and kill kind of a thing. We're just gonna like, we're just gonna like download information into you. And so when we try and do something different, they're not used to it. It's, it's weird. And now we're walking through the school and going outside or going into the scary basement or going on, what, what are we doing here? It gets weird. So when you say, this is what we're gonna do, but these are the three things I need to make sure that we're doing. I need to make sure that we're lining up ahead of time. I need to make sure that we are walking through the hallway quietly because we don't wanna disturb the other classes. Other students are trying to find success in those classes as well. And then when we get outside, I need you to make sure that you're listening to me for 20 seconds. How long? 20 seconds. Let me hear it. 20 seconds. 20 seconds to get the direction so you know what's going down. That's it. Cool, can we all do that? If we can't do that, go back to the classroom. You have to have a conversation again. The bottom line here is, if you say you're gonna do something, do it, be about it. And the last thing, look, I think at the end of the year, one of the things I've found a great amount of success with is just adding some fun things into these new rules, procedures, policies, whatever you're doing in class. So one of my fun new rules that I've done in the past is, we applaud everybody that comes to the door, right? I teach with my door closed, it's very loud in the hallway. So if someone comes to my room, typically they'll knock, but even if they just walk in, we will stop anything we are doing and give a round of applause to whoever is walking into the door. This has a couple of different effects. One, some people love it. It is the greatest part of their day. They will leave and come back to get another round of applause. Other people, like one of my best friends, Miss Cho, Cho hates this. She looks at me like I'm an idiot every single time I do it and she makes her not want to come to my room and she calls me or texts me instead. But every time she does it, she smiles and we, we get her and it's hilarious. So applauding people, sometimes giving a standing ovation uh, will just happen spontaneously also, especially if students really like whoever just walked into the room. Have a celebration. Uh, have a cereal party, have a birthday party, have a celebration that your students did really well on the recent assessment or that your homework average went up significantly or that it's, you know, it's Groundhog's Day or it's Earth Day or it's Bubble Day. Just celebrate weird holidays. There's a million of them. You can look them right up online and, and I think that just finding a way to reason to celebrate is a great way to bring your class back together. In that vein, you could also figure out a class trip to take. Uh, in a lot of places where folks are, at least if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it is getting much nicer outside. Finding a place to do a class trip and remembering that not all class trips have to be a full day. They can be a part day also. Or finding somewhere outside of your classroom to do work. Like I said earlier with the Lord of the Flies uh, thing that we did, it is finding somewhere that's not in your classroom that you could display or, or disseminate or, or tell the students the same information, have them do the same activity, but not in the confines of the same old classroom. Sometimes that's the thing that's getting boring is it's the same old routine every day and we have to just liven it up. You can do the same exact thing that you had planned just somewhere else. And even if that's going outside for 10 minutes, that is has a tremendous effect on students. Now, I do recommend doing that at the end of class and having it be like an incentive. So like, look, y'all, I want to go outside and do this thing today. I have this really quick experiment that I want to do, but I have to make sure that we can get done the other stuff that we have to do. And then put it as an incentive. If kids can't do it that day, maybe there's another day during the week that they could do it. But just it's the idea of getting up, getting out, trying something new, trying something fun, and in injecting a little bit of that F word that schools hate so much, you know, fun. Before we go, I wanna thank our sponsor, OrCam, for sponsoring this video. You can find everything out about the OrCam Learn in the description box below, click the link. And if there's anything else you need from us, just go right over to realwrapwithreynolds.com and we'd be happy to help you with anything that we can. That's it, gang. Peace.